everyone. Welcome to episode 22 of Behind the Brush. I'm Joy Baker with All About Art Gallery, and today we're on a field trip. We are in Gallatin, Tennessee, in the woodworking studio of one of our local artists, David Moore. Hi, David. Hi. Thank you so much for having us over today. My pleasure. Well, we're so excited to be here. Uh, we've been representing David's work for a few years now. Quite a few. Um, and we get so many comments on it at the gallery. He is a woodworking artist for sure. Um, and we're just really excited to be here and see kind of where the magic happens, I guess you would oh, yeah. say. So you're in Gallatin now, but you're yes. not always from Tennessee, right? No, no. I grew up in Virginia. Okay. And then uh, uh, when I was in high school, my parents moved to Buffalo, New York, where my mother was originally from. Okay. And uh, then I went to college in New York mm -hmm. and stayed up there. I got a degree in fine arts. And uh, well, with a degree in fine arts, you either do it or you're a teacher. And I became a teacher. <laughs> And I taught up there for in the Rochester area for 33 years. Oh, wow. What did you teach? I taught, uh, well, I taught middle school for a while. And then I, at the high school, I taught sculpture and 3D design. And in, my, oh. in that class, we did a little bit of everything. We did ceramics. We did jewelry. We did wood, which was my favorite. Okay. Um, uh, stained glass. You name it, anything that had to do, even cardboard and things like that. So handcrafting uh, arts. Right. One of my favorite examples, uh, not examples, but one of the favorite assignments that I did with the students was with um, in, in cahoots with the phys ed department. And it was nice because they paid for the supplies. But uh, winters in Rochester are long, mm -hmm. as you can well imagine. So what the assignment was for the, my advanced uh, sculpture kids, they each took a famous painting mm -hmm. and they turned it into a three-dimensional object that was a miniature golf uh, target and okay. then the phys ed teachers they could play miniature golf in the gym and the, <laughs> the each hole was a painting so okay. that was kind of fun I enjoyed that and like I said the phys ed department paid for it which was really okay. nice that works. but uh, I just you know I did that for 33 years and uh, then New York came out with an incentive to get rid of people like me. Oh, and, so happy uh, retirement. <laughs> and, and I retired in 99, and my wife, Luann, and I moved down here, and uh, I built the workshop, and now instead of teaching it, I'm doing it. Nice. Which I really enjoy. So is teaching for all those years and being kind of hands-on, is that what sort of led you into the, um, the woodworking that you do today? Well, I did woodworking while I was teaching also, but okay. uh, both my grandfathers worked with wood a lot, and my dad was an auto mechanic, so... Ever since I was a little kid, uh, I've been working with my hands. I'd go. To, he had his own garage in Virginia, mm -hmm. and I'd go up there and work on cars with him as a little kid. So I'm used to working with my hands, and I just really, if I can't, I get nervous after a while. I got to do something. <laughs> so, and wood is my favorite. So that's that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Well, tell me a little bit about your favorite. What's your favorite wood to work with? Do you have one? Uh, well, actually, there's three of them that I like to work with a lot, cherry, walnut, and maple. Okay. And then I try to incorporate them, uh, at least two in every project instead of just, a lot of times it's just one, but if I can incorporate, like say, cherry and walnut or, or maple and walnut or mm -hmm. something like, like that, I like the contrast between the woods and everything. I really do. What do you have here? What kind of well, wood is this one? This one is walnut and maple and a little bit of oak down at the bottom. Okay. And the reason I this one is here, I this one I just finished recently, like this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had this piece of walnut and this piece of walnut in the back room where I store my lumber. Mm -hmm. And I've been looking at it for a long time, thinking, what can I do with it? Because I just think it's a beautiful piece of wood. It is. It's and, lovely. I love this very unique. Oh, absolutely. Thing. So I wanted to somehow show those off without... Uh, cutting them up or whatever. So that's how I put the two together with the maple base or the, the stand here that goes down to a base. So, uh, but when I do things, there's two things I have to keep in mind. The design, mm -hmm. and it's because it's a functional piece, it has to work. It has to stand if, up. If it doesn't work, <laughs> then it's no good. I mean, mm -hmm. if it were strictly a sculpture, well, that's that's okay. I'm not criticizing that, but it, because what I'm doing is functional. Mm -hmm. For example, my guitar stands, which you have at the uh, gallery. Yes. If they didn't hold a guitar or if they didn't stand up, What's the point? they wouldn't. What good would they be? <laughs> so uh, I have to yeah. keep those two things in mind: the design and are they functional. So you're an engineer too, really, because well, you have to be able to make it balanced and. Work. Maybe I don't know. One, I remember one of the one of the courses I took in college was industrial design, 
microphone. Excuse me, which I really enjoyed a lot. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that we had to do, it's going to sound kind of odd, but one of the, we had to actually make a prototype of an object that we designed ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it, it, now you couldn't, you couldn't design, this is back in the early 60s when I was in college. So it had to be something that you could actually make. It couldn't be like a rocket that would go to the moon, obviously. But anyway, the thing that I designed and made a prototype, and it worked, was rockers for a wheelchair. Okay. <laughs> so you, you, you built these two rockers, and they had a groove in there that you could wheel the chair in. Okay. And lock it into place, and a person in a wheelchair. And be able to rock. Be able to rock, yeah. And did it work? It worked, yeah. Well, why don't you have a patent on it? Why I should. <laughs> <laughs> I've, been, I've been asked that question. Back in the 60s, it was very, very difficult. I thought about getting a patent. I even talked to an attorney about it. But it was very expensive and very difficult to get a patent. And then it just, eh, it just faded away. And the last time I saw those, uh, the, the rockers that I made, the, the, the model, was they were in my dad's basement in Buffalo. Oh. So I don't know where they are now. Where I, are they now? They could be thrown away. My dad's been dead for 20 years, so I don't know where they are. Who knows? <laughs> but uh, anyway, so that, that and if you want to talk about engineering, I guess you could say I had to engineer something like that. Yeah. Which I enjoyed exactly. very much. So. That does sound pretty cool. Well, how do you continue to learn and grow as an artist? Are there well, I'm getting better. Let's put it that way. <laughs> like better. I'm talking about the 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 actual joinery and finishing and that. Mm -hmm. You know, each piece I try to make it better than the one I did before because you know you got to grow. I mean, if you, mm -hmm. and I belong to a group called the Cumberland Furniture Guild. Mm -hmm. And if I ever have a question, but there are other artists in the guild mm -hmm. who I can call and ask to uh, uh, for technical questions and things like that. Okay. So uh, you know that's how I'm doing it, just by just by doing it. Every time you do something, it gets hopefully it gets better than the one before better. it. Right. Do you ever, after you've completed a piece, do you ever like change the setup of your workshop or something? Because having made that, you're like, hmm, I feel like this should be different. You ever change anything? You mean the the piece would be different? You mean or like if you're making something and you realize that you want to put this table over here? Like, does that ever happen where you feel like? Nah, it's too difficult to rearrange the shop. <laughs> it took three of us just to bring that machine in. <laughs> so there, everything in here is really heavy. Gotcha. So and you've uh, accumulated these kind of over time, right? Like you you built your studio when you moved here. I but... built a building when we moved here. That took me six months, and then because when I was teaching, I worked summers as a carpenter, so I had carpentry skills. Okay. So uh, I built a I built a shop, and then I went out and bought the machines one at a time. Over how long? Maybe the course of three years before I got everything that I have. Did you see here now? I brought a few things down with me. I, sh I brought a sander down. I brought a small table saw down. But th all the bigger machines you see in here now, I accumulated once we got here. Well, and well, you've the, got the, a great setup. It seems like you've got. I like it a lot. I really need. do. It's uh, you know that's where I spend a lot of my time. I really do. Uh, my wife was retired from teaching now, but when she was teaching, when she'd leave in the morning to go to school, mm -hmm. I'd come out and work, go and eat lunch, come back out and work until she got home from school. Mm -hmm. So I was actually running it like, well, I still run it like a business because I do yeah. pay taxes on what I sell. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of be legit. <laughs> but uh, uh, I don't spend as much time as I used to because I'm getting older. <laughs> it happens to the best of us. It does. But I still enjoy it out here. I really do. I mean... If I didn't like the way it is, I probably would spend even less time. Mm -hmm. So, where do you draw your inspiration from? Are there any certain people who inspire you? Other woodworkers? Well, or was, like just yeah, a piece the, of wood. The, well, I the wood actually, and I don't want to use that hokey. You know, you've heard people say, "Well, the wood speaks to me." Well, <laughs> I don't consider that, but uh, the wood does. I look at the wood. That's where I get some inspiration from. But uh, I really like Art Deco a lot. Mm -hmm. That's probably. I can see that as being an inspiration for your yeah. work. There's been several pieces that we've had in our shop that have been very Art Deco. Art Deco, Art Deco right. Inspired. And then the other one I like a lot, which is different from Art Deco, but I like Art Nouveau also because Art Deco is very geometric, mm -hmm. and Art Nouveau has got a lot of natural, wavy, curvy lines. curvy lines, organic. But sometimes you can get the two to, not some, you know, if you, you can get them to work together. I like those a lot. And then I like Craftsman style. Mm -hmm. The way, you know, the, the joinery and everything in Craftsman style is just, superb mm -hmm. so uh, but anyway 
Do you have a favorite way of um, putting something together? Like, I don't. Yeah. The, the only one that comes to mind for me is dovetail. That's the only one. Well, I've know, done. But. I've got a dovetailing jig, which I've used occasionally. That's I use that mostly for drawers and things like that. But mm -hmm. uh, either either um, a mortise and tenon joinery, mm -hmm. or uh, I use a lot of doweling also to hold pieces together. Gotcha. For example, on this one, this front shelf is doweled into. The back shelf with I don't know, six or eight dowels in there for okay. strength. Gotcha. But the new glues that they have nowadays are so strong that you can, don't even need doweling. Uh, but I do it anyway. It helps me line <laughs> things up a lot. <laughs> I really do. But uh, anyway, it's, uh, so those are my inspirations. Not a person per se, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, just styles of art, mm -hmm. mostly from the 30s. I guess I should go back to the 30s. Gotcha. Do you have a favorite piece that you've ever built? I've got a couple of them in the house there. The one I've never sold. I don't know why. Well, I do know why. It's too big. Oh. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, each after I sell them, they're gone, and uh, I'm ready to do something else. Yeah. Uh, with the exception of making guitar stands, which you sell for me. <laughs> I try not to do the same thing over and over and over. Um, but when it has to f serve a function, like the guitar stand, mm -hmm. it's got to be that way. And I know now, it I've pains done, you a little to paint it, too. Well, yeah, and I <laughs> hate that. It, not paint it, I hate painting wood. I love, because I think wood <laughs> is, is beautiful in and of itself. But uh, uh, even with a guitar stand, I've done some variations on the theme, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I always go back to the original, because that seems to be the, the one that people like, and it works. And, you know, I'm the one who designed it, so I guess I like it, too, because... Well, it's a unique and kind of timeless design, really. Like, I can see how that design sort of does speak to the Art Deco sort of feel. Like, right. with the cool geometric look of it. Um, but it goes with any decor. We have people who are transitional, contemporary, traditional. Like, it, it goes with everyone's well, stuff. Good. So, I got, and really actually, powerful. if you look at one of my music stands, which I, you've, I think you've still got one in the gallery. Or yes, and you've not, created some but, really unique ones for yeah. us, too. The fun part of the music stand is the curve is the same. Actually, the curve, I'm giving away a secret here, it's the the uh, music stand is the guitar stand in reverse. It's just spun around. Okay. But uh, the design part of the music stand is the part that holds the music. Mm -hmm. And that's where each one of those is different. Or I try to make it different. Uh, so that's where the creativity and that kind of comes in. Gotcha. So. Do you have a favorite time of year to work? I like it when I can have the doors open because for... Not only just for health reasons, because it gets the dust out, yeah. <laughs> but I just like looking out and seeing if I'm, when those doors are closed in the wintertime, I feel like I'm more closed in here. More closed in. Right. Yeah. And it's also, I like, I like warm weather. I really do. I mean, living in Buffalo, New York, if you've ever, ever been there, <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it starts snowing in October and it snows until April. So you know, I like it when it's warm and, uh, also uh, the, the temperature has a lot to do with putting finishes on too. If it's cold. Oh. The finishes there take a lot longer to dry to and everything. dry, yeah, I would assume so. And the glue too. I've seen glue if if it's really cold, um, the glue will turn white where it squeezes out sometimes, mm -hmm. and you can just tell it's too cold. Gotcha. So the temperature is your um, is the varnish that you use is that a secret or would you? Share no, I just use I use a, a wipe on polyurethane right here. No, no secret. I ought to get a, some money from Minwax, but. Uh, <laughs> But I use wipe on polyurethane. It's it's a very simple finish, but you got to be you got to sand carefully between coats and everything. Oh, so you apply I, I it. I always and put then at least three again. coats. Yeah, oh, you apply it, let it dry, it. sand it with two twenty sandpaper. Mm -hmm. Apply it, let it dry, another twenty four hours. People have asked me many times, how long does it take you to make a piece? Mm -hmm. Well, I said like a guitar stand, I can make that in two days, mm -hmm. but I can't because. I have to when I glue the pieces together, I gotta let those dry, mm -hmm. and then when they're dry, then I do sanding. Well, actually, I sand them before I glue them. But then uh, after they're all together, put a coat of polyurethane on, let it dry for 24 hours, <laughs> sand it, let it dry, sand it, put another coat. I put three coats on, and then the final coat, believe it or not, and this is no, I'm not giving away any secrets, but the, you sand it with a brown paper bag. Interesting. Because the bag's got just enough grit to it. It was like 2,000 grit or something mm -hmm. to knock off any little bumps or anything. Mm -hmm. And it makes it real, like, feels really smooth. And, and so that's after the final that's coat a, of polish? That's it. That's the final coat. That's the last coat. thing you do? That's the last thing I do, yes. Nice. I used to, when I first started making pieces, put um, 
uh, Danish oil on, which makes the wood beautiful, mm -hmm. but it's just not a real uh, hard finish, and it's it's very delicate in terms of like if you had a table with Danish oil on it, and you put a glass on it, it's going to leave it's a mark. <laughs> right, polyurethane, you're, it's pretty forgiving because it's basic. Okay. When I was in college, my one of my wood instructors said, "Oh, when you put polyurethane on, you're actually enclosing it in plastic," and he hated that. Mm -hmm. And it's true, but if you want to have a durable you finish, want it to last, yeah. That's what so you do. sometimes you have to make compromises. I mean, if I I just leave it natural, that'd be nice, but you can't do that. Well, the finish on it really richens it up. It's amazing the difference of something oh, that's been coated. Absolutely, you can see this immediately when you put it on. One thing I learned from you a couple years ago, I think when we first started representing you, was that, I don't know if this is all woods, but cherry wood in particular, as it's exposed to sunlight, it will continue to richen. It gets darker and, and darker, yeah. It yeah. gets and richer and richer looking, yes. Yeah, that was really interesting mm -hmm. to me. I didn't know that. Yeah, no, Are there cherry? any other woods that do that, or is it uh, cherry? There might be. I just don't know all of them, apparently. But uh, <laughs> uh, cherry is the one that is the most obvious. Actually, uh, maple, when you put a finish on it, and over the years, it becomes more and more amber. Uh, as, as it start when you have raw maple, mm -hmm. it's pretty white or very very light. Mm -hmm. But when you put a finish on it, it ambers it somewhat. Mm -hmm. And then as the sun uh, is exposed to sunlight over the years, it gets more yellow and yellow. But that's just the way it is. I don't. There might be something you could put on that would uh, probably UV rays or something that would maybe. Uh, be resistant. It, right, but I don't know what it is. Hmm. But nice. So, you know, would, they do change over the years. Well, David, this has been really informative. I am so well, appreciative of you having us here and letting us look around your studio well, and I see kind of I like you know, I like showing my shop off. I really do. Well, you you should be proud of it. This is a really really inspiring place to create. Um, you've got the the nature all around you. You have a great bit of property and your workshop is so organized. We like it here a lot. <laughs> well, yeah. For anyone who doesn't know, we are all about art gallery and custom framing. We are located at 260 West Main Street in Hendersonville, Tennessee. And you can reach us at 615-826-9880. Or you can find us on the internet, allaboutartgallery.com or on Facebook. Um, thanks again, David. We really appreciate uh, having us. I enjoyed having you out. And anytime anyone wants to come and visit, they're more than welcome. Field trip. <laughs>